Hi, my name is Katherine Colbert, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors of Piano Spheres. On behalf of the board, our staff, and our core artists, I want to thank you for tuning in to our virtual concert. Piano Spheres has been around for 27 years, and whether you've been a fan for the entire 27 years, or if this is your first concert experience, we're grateful that you're here. And as a part of our community, I want to ask that you consider donating to our Piano Spheres Artist Aid Fund. Right now, more than ever, and especially in the absence of paid ticketed concerts, we need your financial support for the survival of our organization. You can donate by going to our website, pianospheres.org, or by talking to any of our staff members to learn more. Thank you in advance for your contribution. You are truly a part of what is making us able to present these fantastic concerts, both on the stage and now on the screen. Let's start with um, the first piece that's on the yeah. program, Schubert Variations, by Lee Hoiby. And just how a variation form works and what, you know, what, what can we listen for? Our, our most rudimentary sense of variation is a given uh, fundamental theme or a given set of harmonies. Sometimes it's just a progression. And in a much older sense, a variation elaborates uh, with a very strong presence of the, either the melodic contour that it's varying or the harmonic structure. As we move on into Beethoven and then Brahms and so forth, uh, the harmonies are then explored further, they're uh, turned into other things, and we change keys. We don't necessarily stay in one key if it's based on a tonal theme. Uh, in this case, the, the variations are based on a Lentler by Schubert, and uh, you have A bars and A bars, and it takes a little, just a mild journey uh, from minor to something like major, but not mm -hmm. for too long, and then yeah. back to the minor, and explores just a couple of side harmonies mm -hmm. that uh, will later all give Hoybees a chance to find different routes to go with it. Mm -hmm. And so his each, I'd say each variation is more like a portrait. It, these, these don't have quite the through feeling of some variation cycles, mm -hmm. or uh, as we've come to maybe see in a developmental way that each variation needs to lead uh, consequentially to the next, or by opposition mm -hmm. of, you know, through contrast, maybe that's another way. But um, there is a, a a build-up at the in the final variation, so there's a kind of dra dramatic conclusion to everything. But yeah. uh, one kind of imagines that he he took each uh, variation to be a, a isolated little moment in itself, and that it, it's a sort of a vignette.
you are known for excellent programming. And I just kind of like to know how you conceive of the program that you do. Uh, it usually goes something like stone soup. I begin with uh, some, some idea, some piece I would like to do. In this case, it happened to be the Hoibi variations. And as time goes by, I start a little bit waiting for the universe to send me things also. Uh, I start to think of things that might marry well with this piece. Or as I get to uh, try out many works, I, I wonder what, what is the kind of principle happening here or are there little reflections happening from one piece to another. Mm -hmm. And then before you know it, you have a bunch of works and then you try to find a coherent shape for all those. Uh, in the case of this program, I, I have to say that uh, it's with a wry glint in my eye that I basically call it variations and studies because that's like the most archetypical way that people might think of the driest aspect of doing contemporary music. Oh, and um, <laughs> that's only said tongue in cheek. So yeah. I wanted to uh, give voice to the fact that I had assembled some works that have a principle of variation involved and then others that explored the word study in different ways because mm -hmm. a study isn't always about working out your fingers, it's about exploring musical ideas. It can be uh, uh, what you might call a uh, etude de style, the French have something for the, you know, the, yeah. the style of playing the piano. Right. And some etudes are strictly uh, torturous to get you get at your technique more. But So there's a little bit of all that in, in these pieces on yeah. this program. Yeah.
uh, number six, I believe, yes, is um, very, uh, very sort of spacious and has a tune that is moving slowly through it with then a sort of rippling cascade of notes that's weaving around it almost like a garland. Well, the tune that's moving through it is called, is a hymn called Bethany, which is also known as Near My God to Thee, which is used also very prominently in the final movement of Ives's fourth symphony, which is his major statement and might be the quote unquote great American symphony. Um, this is an example of where you hear something that is familiar, but it's surrounded now by this context where it becomes otherworldly. And you feel that this is something that is rooted in your experience and yet it is turned into something completely new. Um, and that's, I think that's the thing about quotation for Ives. It's not just collage, though he did now, he now and then he did, you know, pieces which were just, you know, collages of tunes all at once. Uh, the Fourth of July, which is an orchestral piece, is like that. But he would often, you know, embed things and make them uh, become a, a new, a, a new version of themselves so that you'd barely recognize them. You have composed a piece for, that you're playing, and so uh, there is a nice story that goes along with that, and it would be nice if you mentioned it. Uh, the reason I wrote this piece was that I was in the, the mood of uh, being inspired by the Debussy etudes for which I did a project commissioning other composers. This was the Debussy project that we did a couple of years ago. I think it was 18. Yeah. And um, so in, in the process of doing that, I did write one myself, and I also used an electronic track for that. But uh, as, as happens with composers, you know, deadlines start looming closer and closer, and you begin to get a little nervous. So I thought, well, just in case, I think uh, I should have maybe one or two other things kind of ready to go. And I ended up, you're, yeah, you're, and so I, I did end up working on material uh, for an octave etude. I mean, the octave mm -hmm. etude is the final of the set. Yeah. We had a much, we also had a wonderful version of that, but I yeah. also decided to try something that is, uh, you know, it's kind of, uh, it doesn't aim to be um, extremely 
uh, profound or um, mm. or esoteric or anything. It's just that we have to play octaves a lot at the piano, and and then uh, there is this one might call it first of all technical um, preoccupation with the white keys and the black keys. Yes. Just in all kinds of music, yes. but then as the 20th century progresses, it becomes a, a compositional um, preoccupation too. Yeah, one person famous for that was Berg, who liked collections of notes that used white notes and then another collection of black key notes, but um, they have their, I mean, they have the elements of being, uh, going towards pentatonic or diatonic with the white keys. And so I, I also included right. a whole tone yes. with my etude. And then yeah. I, I, there's just one small spot where there's an, the typical illusion of being able to play two full octaves, but you really just have three fingers going and it, it covers the territory. And uh, we don't worry too much that we haven't heard two full mm -hmm. octaves. But then at other points, I uh, changed the narrative a little bit by going to major sevenths and, and ninths yeah. as well. That those are the almost octaves. So. <laughs> and um, that's, that's how it came to be. Yeah. So it's been, uh, it has been played once before, and this would be the first time it's, you could call it our Los Angeles premiere. Our Los Angeles premiere. I think that's excellent. That sounds like a, you know, whatever, 10th plus an octave. However, if, if you were to stick your head in the piano and really listen to the E, which is an overtone of the low C clashing with the, with the E exactly, like you said, you would hear all kinds of wondrous rippling overtones. And, and um, this is kind of the idea of the piece. You know, the, the question was, how do I sonify this? How do I make this clear so that you can hear exactly this um, in a more conventional context. And so um, 
the, the pianist is instructed to play with a little tiny speaker that's about the size of a tennis ball, um, which is placed inside the resonating body of the piano, which emits sine tone resonances, you know, just very pure, simple, simple digital resonances, which to my ears sound like the natural decay of, of the piano. Um, and there's this, yeah, it's an eight minute exploration of, of um, you know, how these kind of resonances play off one another. It's very slow and it's very patient, but um, I really like this. I think this is one of my favorite pieces. It's, it's for some reason, pieces of mine, I should say. Um, yeah, I don't know, it's somehow, was really hard to write. It sounds very simple. Um, and I think in certain contexts, it can almost sound improvised, but it took me a ton of time to get this right. Um, you know, composing music for me um, is much more difficult when you're dealing with kind of super slow, glacially paced material. So it was a, it was a hard piece to write, but um, I think uh, it's one of the pieces that, of mine that I actually will listen to <laughs> on occasion.
So I, I, there's I a whole that. repertoire of pieces that grew out of that journey. And yeah. in a way, Play Like a Girl is one of those pieces. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up at a juke joint in Mississippi, in rural Mississippi, outside of Cleveland, Mississippi, which is in the Delta, right. um, where um, there was an electric acoustic festival going on, sponsored by, I believe, Delta State. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the young people there, young men there, said to the organizer that somebody else was being a girl about getting up on the bandstand and improvising, right? And I was so appalled. You know, this is 2009, and this is a person who's, you know, got some kind of an education. I mean, they're a graduate student in electroacoustic music, for God's sake, right? And they're saying, in order to denigrate somebody, that they're being a girl? I was like, oh, no. Like, right. no. <laughs> <laughs> I was so enraged. At, not even enraged. Sort of more like heartbroken. It just mm -hmm. sort of felt like wow, I thought that kind of dismissive misogyny was at least out of style, you know? Mm -hmm. But I was wrong. And so so that's that was the instigation of, yeah. of this piece. Yeah. I want to hear about what the process was for you of, of because you're doing eight variations, is it? Yeah, in other words, I, <clears throat> I I deconstructed your your layers, uh, of which uh, to explain to the audience uh, your inspiration from the Bulgarian song uh, brought forth eight layers of music that uh, are you call in some sense a variation, but uh, they can all be played together, stacked, and I thought about stretching them out one by one not not exactly uh in a certain order but that sometimes there is a combination of let's say one of the pulse tracks and um maybe the fifth uh variation and then uh, maybe in as a latent background you'd have the um the first variation as a track and then something more active going on beyond that and um, I have to say, maybe it's a little corny, perhaps, but the, I, I think of it as a prelude is the first piece. And then the f next several movements, there are six of those. And then the f there's a finale and the finale brings forth all of the layers at once. And I have, a, I've, speaking of the sax, I did use the sax for one of the voices and um, then working with uh, our friend Hunter Oaks, we created a track that um, used various synthesizer sounds to embody your variations. And uh, in the prelude, I, I tried to, um, first I focused just on the, the pulse and then uh, at the end of that movement, which is approximately three minutes, uh, I sort of tapered it down so we didn't quite get the full climax that you get of the song. Mm -hmm. So it, it wouldn't quite give the full Monty yet. And then um, I give it, uh, what I was going to say was the corny part maybe is that I give uh, snippets of, of each of the variations as a kind of uh, foretaste of, of what's coming. And I, I, I do play the, the part of the variation where it does happen in time. But uh, you know, then I had drop a few notes out of one, or I, ah. one point, I only I only use four bars of of one, but they do happen in the sequence of where they would happen in their own time. Got it. Got it. And so it, it's a kind of concertato idea, and um, uh, most of the time I'm playing the piano, but I do uh, actually do the the song, the more song like one in on the melodica. Which, cool really feels like the kind of readiness of the the women's voices and then the toy piano is used and i decided just to use each of them once 
to make them a little more special and um, and then finally uh, we get uh, my the next to last movement I I, I start playing the, the pulse and then Great. leading in finally to the the final movement and obviously these are movements that are uh, I think once people kind of start hearing it from segment to segment they'll they'll begin to feel where these points are right but because your should... your original segment is is about uh, what two minutes and 54 seconds or something like that so it's almost 24 minutes long yeah from a very uh, pragmatic standpoint it it also allows for uh, a long piece to um to cover some time and to uh, give me a chance to kind of settle in and and then I, I, a lot of, I, I kind of want to say part of my performance has already happened in, in as uh -huh. much working with Hunter, figuring out timbres, uh, asking him, let's suppress this or let's bring it up here. Or uh, I need to have um, uh, another sound that I, you know, I'm trying to find the right, whatever, xylophone or something. And.
Hello, my name is Mark Saltzman and I am also a member of the Board of Directors of Piano Spheres. Again, a big thank you for joining us today. We are truly grateful. Just a reminder that our musical presentations are being offered for free this year. However, the cost for production and the artists are not. Free, that is. So, every dollar you give goes directly to support the incredible talent you are experiencing. If you can, please donate to our Artist Aid Fund through our website, pianospheres.org, or by speaking with any of our staff members who will be happy to assist you. Once again, I want to personally thank you for being here today and for any financial assistance that you can provide us. See you at our next event.